All right, here's a brief oversimplified story, but that I think is really interesting. So the past hundred years of cars that we've had cars, all the best performing cars for the drivers have been these huge, powerful gas engines with as light of a package as possible. Those are the ones everyone's enjoying the most. But then very quickly, kind of out of nowhere in the past few years, we got these electric cars that just started smoking everything, at least in a straight line, right? So we suddenly have these family sedans with a thousand plus horsepower that are unbeatable in a drag race. So performance car enthusiasts noticed that, of course, but they weren't swayed. They still love the feeling of an exhaust and then shifting gears and the loud noises that come with it. Even if it's the literal definition of inefficiency, it's still fun, right? Communicating with the car. So sports car makers had a choice to make. They have a decision now. How do we give people all these benefits of this incredible instant torque and this electric drivetrain but also still give them the loud engine and the big, powerful shifting gears feeling that they still love. And so this, this here behind me, this is the Ferrari 296 GTB, an absolutely ridiculous car you might be saying, and I agree, but I'm using it as an excuse to talk about this new hybrid drivetrain thing happening to sports cars and supercars that we're gonna start seeing a lot more of and it's it's kind of the perfect example to talk about this so this is kind of the perfect example here right this is a ferrari and ferraris have been v8s and v12s and performance cars for years with incredible soundtracks and massive engines and great performance but recently they've added two hybrids to their lineup the sf90 and the 296 which is this guy uh it's the first badged ferrari car ever to have a v6 engine it's a smaller three liter v6 in the back right behind the driver but there's a lot more to it because there's also now a hybrid drivetrain, there's my shadow, with an electric motor between the rear wheels as well. So you've probably heard of these a little bit. It's been happening for a little. McLaren's doing this with the Artura. Acura does it with the NSX, the Porsche 918 Spyder. They've been testing an, a hybrid 911, and there's probably going to be a bunch of hybrid Lamborghinis coming up soon. But it's fun to see, you know, this is, this is now the Ferrari way of doing it. And it's kind of incredible. I mean, this car is obviously super good, but I, I do find it fascinating how they've combined these things. So first of all, just walking around the car, you can tell, I'll do my ultra wide angle again. It is a low car. That is a very low car and it's a low mounted, small three liter V6 in the back there. Just to get the whole car down this low, it's awesome. But I'm a big fan of the back end of this car. You've got the lights here. You've got a little bit of active aero actually that will sort of tuck up and it's carbon fiber and it pops out the back to help as an assist for your drag when you're braking. You also see the exhaust center mounted and the huge the rear diffuser is just massive on the bottom of this car. I love the rear of the 296. Then you come around the sides and you do have all the sort of classics of a mid-engine supercar. That's a vent giving you air into that rear engine. This glass does come up and you can see a lot more of the engine in there. But here is a charge port and on the other side is a gas tank. There's so many cool details. This is the handle to get into the car, which I'll show you the interior in a second, but there's all this carbon fiber here. These huge wheels, staggered 21 inch and 20 inch, massive carbon fiber brakes in here. You can see, I mean, there's a ton of exposed, oh man. These brakes are incredible on this car too. Then up on the front, even this active aero, air coming in underneath the headlights to cool the brakes. It's gonna blink because I'm walking away, but a little bit more active aero and sliding under the front of the car which is actually different from the SF90 because you get a real front trunk. So here's the key and it's a little bit of a cube and I kind of think it's cool because there's a spot in the car to mount it, but double tap the front here. And one of the advantages of a mid-engine car, I guess you could say, there is a actually really generously sized front trunk. That's good for two duffel bags, not one, two duffel bags. But let me, let me not get carried away. I could talk about the aesthetics all day. This is, a red Ferrari after all, but let me talk a little bit more about the drivetrain. We gotta get inside. So here it is. This is how you get into the driver's seat. And it's so low that again, you do the little dance to get over the sill. You get in, you're in the cockpit. 296, and man, I might not be the, the biggest fan of Ferrari as a brand, and the stuff that they do, but I have to admit, this is an incredible interior. Aesthetics is really the only thing I don't love about most of it, but here you get in the car and to turn it on, well, 
I'll get into the steering wheel actually in a second. This is the thing that I don't like the most, but this haptic button right here, this touchscreen button is the ignition. That's how you start this car. You hit that once, it beeps at you a bunch of times. One, two, three, four, five, six. Every time you get in the car, that's annoying. There's a spot to put the key right here, which is super cool. But just this whole stack here in the middle is cool. This is your uh, windows opening and closing. They don't have to be particularly good at noise dampening because I want to hear stuff when I'm in this car. There's your gears, at least for your automatic versus manual, your reverse gear. Also, huge carbon fiber paddle shifters. But you also have one single cup holder here, your hazards button, and a wireless charger for your phone that actually does fit and charge a pretty large phone, that being the Pixel 7 Pro pretty sweet there. Not super visible as far as navigation, but I'll give it a pass. It's a supercar. And then this just feels like a cockpit. Everything is pretty minimal, and this is where it starts to fall apart because I'm not a fan of haptic buttons here, haptic buttons over here, and then tons of haptic buttons to navigate through the menus and the UI. Baffling choice to me. I think they're, they just wanted to make it feel sort of like a race car and they did a lot of stuff here. Obviously you still have the switches and there are still hard switches here for some stuff, but like ah, the blinkers on the steering wheel, fine, real buttons. These aren't real. And then when you switch your drive modes, even these are touchscreen buttons. I just think in general, cars should have physical switches for things that you're going to do more than a few times while driving, especially climate controls. So I think that was a bit of a miss. They do that in the SF92, but it still does feel like a cockpit. And I'm a fan of the overall feel of the things that point towards me, materials, leather, carbon fiber. There's really adjustable seats. These are actually, there aren't the carbon fiber bucket seats or anything, but they are power adjustable, which is cool. Having the stuff in the middle by the driver, it feels like a cockpit in here. But I'm gonna hit this start button one more time because it's gonna fire up the car itself. I'm gonna go into race mode so it turns the engine on itself. And you can hear that little baby V6. That's not bad. It sounds a lot better than a lot of other V6s that I've heard. So it does sound incredible, but what does that electric motor do? Right? So I hit this button right here. You can see the other modes and I'm gonna go E-Drive. The engine turns off. We're in fully automatic, single gear of just electric motor driving. And now it's silent. You can go up to about 15 miles on a charge in the electric only mode and up to about 80 miles an hour. It doesn't sound like much. It's, it's honestly a pretty small amount. It's only a 7.45 kilowatt hour battery right behind me. But imagine this, you're the neighbor with the red Ferrari, right? Kind of obnoxious, but at least so you don't make them mad when you wake up in the morning, when you pull out of your garage, you go into e-drive mode and you don't wake anybody up at this crazy hour with your loud car. You drive away perfectly silently. You drive through the residential streets. It's a quiet car. It doesn't drive too much attention because it's not loud and exhaust and fumes and pops and burbles. And then you get to the highway. Then you start your commute. Then you hit that button then you do your thing. That I think is the real point, at least a little bit more advantageous to me than the other performance gains of the electric motors in this car, which is to fill in the gaps in torque when you're shifting gears. Really when you start to accelerate, the initial shove comes from the electric motor and then the engine builds power and the turbos of course spool up, you get all your boost, but it's, it's feeling a little bit more responsive like the instant torque that comes from an electric engine, electric motor. So there are several ways to charge this small electric battery. One of them is you can see the switches in the door right here is gonna be the gas tank or the electric. I'm gonna pop that open and do the getting out the car dance. And you can see this popped open. And this is just a trickle charger for slowly filling up this car. It's not a normal charger that you'd see in, you know, other electric cars. It's just for trickle charging. And of course, if you plug it into a 110 volt outlet, it'll charge relatively quickly. The other way to charge it is just by driving the car. The engine will feed energy into the, uh, into the electric battery when you're braking, when you're driving. If you want to fill it up the fastest, you put it in qualifying mode. And that's when it's going to give you as much regen as possible to add boost when you're driving in a high performance way. But that's, that's what's happening in this drivetrain. And that's what the Ferrari 296 
is made of. Every car company is gonna have to figure out their own way of doing this when they add their electrification of their high-end cars. I loved the Acura NSX. Their Type S, when we had it here, it was right before the autofocus channel started, but that might be the most planted, best feeling drive. It's not as fast, but the best feeling drive of a hybrid supercar I've ever felt. Uh, it was all wheel drive. This one is throwing down a combined nearly, nearly 900 horsepower just to the rear wheels. So it's about 650 horsepower just from the engine and then another 150 horsepower or so just from the electric motor, but it's rear wheel drive. So electric cars, I keep talking about them on this channel and how there's certain things that they're really good at. And I think, well, we've noticed the, the electric muscle cars, which are just big and heavy and, and batteries are heavy and that's fine. But these muscle cars that are just incredible in a straight line, that's been great for electric, but it's a little bit more of a delicate dance with these sports cars that are typically super lightweight that can dance all over a track and that's what they're made for so as far as a road car goes i think this is a win but that's what they're playing with every hybridized version of these previously all gas cars that were known for being lightweight will all be heavier than the gas version but it all has to come with perspective right this is why i keep looking at cars like the tesla model s plaid which is incredible in a straight line uh, and it can get carbon ceramic brakes and it can get taken on a track, but I just don't see that as a, as a, as a track car. It's a, it's a four-door sedan that happens to be incredibly powerful. But this and the way they've balanced the additional weight and they've put it in a spot that makes a lot of sense and weighted things properly, the steering is incredibly responsive. The brakes are still more than enough for stopping this car like this is a this is a well done hybrid and i'm i'm a really big fan of it to be honest so you know it started with the the holy trinity which was the la ferrari the porsche 918 spider and the mclaren p1 loving these hybrid systems in million dollar cars is great but now we're actually going to start to see them in regular everyday not every day i mean this is a <laughs> this is a four hundred and forty four thousand dollars spec behind me but in more of the, the high-end performance car territory, we're gonna start seeing the electrification of them, not just becoming pure EVs, but becoming electrified just like this. And I think that's cool. I would say that the electric drive, leaving your house and not disturbing your neighbors in residential areas part of the electric is actually just as important as the performance benefits that come from the electric motors filling in the torque gaps and waiting for the turbos to spool. But that's just me. Also, this is an incredibly fun review. I got to drive this car for a few days and I don't want to give it back, but I'll give it back. Okay, thanks for watching. See you guys in the next one. Peace.